Hi, my name is Hassad Kim. When one thinks of the word hero, one specific image usually comes to mind. The flying red and blue cape defender of the earth, Superman. At one point, he embodied the model man with his unwavering moral compass and loyalty to Lois Lane. Yet today, he has lost relevance, with some dismissing him as overpowered and outdated. How could a hero go from being a classic film icon to a tacky cliche? What could such a perfect hero still be lacking? True heroism exceeds a flawless moral record. In fact, some of the most timeless heroes are the ones that rise from deep falls in their life. The best hero reflects mankind rather than opposing him. He brings us along in his journey and by the end makes us see ourselves in new light. He meets us in our daily death and lifts us up to new hope, strength, and life. Understanding the fall of heroism in our culture starts with understanding the relationship between culture and Hollywood. Culture impacts Hollywood. Because Hollywood is an industry, it is heavily dependent on its consumers. Thus, current public interests shape on-screen content. For example, the popular discussions of feminism and racial diversity are embodied in the new Disney princess Moana, a Polynesian heroine. On the flip side of culture impacting Hollywood, Hollywood impacts culture. Filmmakers utilize the international platform of film to generate awareness for certain issues and the artistic craft of the film to arouse sympathy in the audience hearts. The purpose of the movie is to move. In the words of Grant Horner, author of Hollywood World Views, Film may be the very best cultural representation, recreation, and or reproduction of human consciousness. Whether human or alien, young or old, Filipino or South African, every Hollywood hero reflects humanity, meaning they shape real lives. Fictional superheroes serve as timeless role models for millions of children and adults alike. Lateral Magazine says that comic book superheroes are based on us, and we feed off their images, integrating their characteristics into our personalities, ethics, and morals. Frequently, however, filmmakers embellish their heroes with a glorified girls, guns, and gamblings lifestyle. Even beyond the physical indulgence, culture has become addicted to mentally, emotionally, and even spiritually selfish heroes. It has become the cult of our culture. Regardless of the message the movie touts, these heroes cannot lead us to a liberating truth and purpose. Yet many heroes continue to fit this mold with little variation. For example, the wildly popular TV show Game of Thrones features graphic debauchery and bloodfest of its characters. Such are the heroes of our culture the very same ones that children continue to dom the cakes of and look up to as role models. Film heroes are in need of reform, but returning to the old mold of Superman is neither creative nor the perfect fix. Instead, I would like to argue that the portrayal of heroes in Hollywood can be developed and redeemed by using the three levels of heroes derived from the biblical concepts of common and redemptive grace the secular hero, the common hero, and the redemptive hero. The common and redemptive graces are elements in the hero's world which, depending on the hero's attitude towards each grace, defines what type of hero he is. The common grace is the grace of God which meets our natural needs and shortcomings. The redemptive grace is the saving grace of God or the equivalent force which a good hero relies on in the context of sin. The three types of heroes vary in their propensity for understanding and responding to both common and redemptive grace. The lowest hero, the secular hero, rejects, dismisses, or is blind to the graces entirely. The common hero humbly realizes his needs and shortcomings and relies on the common grace of God, either implicitly or explicitly, but cannot fully experience the redemptive grace. The best hero, the redemptive hero, realizes not only his shortcomings, but also his sin, and embraces God as a source of both his strength and his salvation. 
The secular hero is the lowest hero on the spectrum of the common and redemptive graces. The secular hero can be divided into two main types, the idealist detached from reality and the cynic detached from humanity. Nancy Piercy, author of Saving Leonardo, shows that throughout history there was a struggle between these two camps of thought, and that without Christian influence, the culture tends to lean in one extreme or the other. Hollywood, which reflects culture, exhibits that tendency to portray heroes as either idealistic or cynical. As Grant Warner puts it, people don't want a life that is like a movie. They want a, people don't want a movie that is like life. They want a life that is like a movie. Man hopes to find redemption in the new hero, but only deepens a split in his own conscience. The resulting heroism is either strikingly beautiful but imaginary, or on the other hand, disturbingly repulsive but real. The deficiencies of the secular hero can be viewed through three facets of the hero's character, the making of the hero, the motivation, and the outcome. The making of the hero is about the hero's engagement with the common and redemptive graces. This facet deals with the graces because the creation of the hero is dependent on the hero's journey rather than its end. The secular hero disregards the common and redemptive graces. His journey is centered on the self and the fulfillment of its desires, and as a result, his relationships are unsustainable. People are reduced to functions of his own desire. The cynic, who holds the view that humans are innately evil or weak, wields this mentality. For example, in the movie Silence, two priests, one named Father Rodriguez, travel to Japan seeking out a respected priest who has apostatized. Ironically, the Jesuit priest Rodriguez is the secular hero. In 1633, they meet the Japanese Christians, are captured, and witness the horrible persecution by Japanese officials. The officials want Christians to renounce their faith quietly instead of dying as martyrs with their faith intact. Through all the torture, crying, and screams, the Christians remain resilient and uncompromising. Yet Rodriguez refuses to see this martyrdom as a form of common grace because he is overwhelmed by the physical aspect of the suffering. He saw the horrible torture, more so than the Christian's resilience. In Silence, God is a central figure, yet the film is far from redemptive. In the climax, Rodriguez is brought before the Fumie, the image of Christ, and is ordered to step on it in renunciation of his faith. He hears the voice of Christ telling him to step on the Fumie, so he listens and tramples. He lives and spends the rest of his life as apostate Paul, daily stepping on Fumie. At the start of the film, he set out as a Jesuit priest to accomplish missionary work and honor God. But by the end, he has failed to do both and has become a practicing Buddhist. Even the voice of Christ that Rodriguez hears is a false form of redemptive grace. The real Christ gave up his earthly life to bring us eternal life. So stepping on Christ in order to preserve one's eternal life is contradictory. Yet Rodriguez steps without repenting of it afterward. Rodriguez fails to rely on the saving grace of God to conquer death and pass into eternal life with him. The idealist too can reveal self-centered motives under the facade of romantic innocence. Disney and Pixar are the prime examples of this, as all their movies and characters embrace faith, trust, and pixie dust. Disney's most recent princess film, Moana, tells the story of the daughter of a Polynesian chief who journeys to return the heart of the goddess to Fiti in order to restore order and harmony to her home island. The story revolves around her personal crusade of self-fulfillment, and as a result, Moana's type of independency segregates her from her own people and her father. From the beginning, her father tells her, you are the future of our people, Moana, and they are not out there, they are here. As a chief in waiting, Moana has a duty to care for her own people, but she escapes them in order to follow her passion of sailing the sea. According to Disney, in, doing, in the battle between doing one's duty and following one's heart, following one's heart is always the right decision, even if it is at the expense of your most important relationships. 
The self always wins. In addition, Moana overlooks her shortcomings. In fact, the movie suggests that she suffered because she did not believe in herself enough and acknowledge who she was at heart. Common grace and redemptive grace are thus absent in the film. The next facet of this secular hero's deficiency can be seen in the motivation, which is to glorify himself. The idealist journey as seen in Moana is essentially a self-righteous crusade masqueraded as a quest for goodness. Rodriguez may be bitter and conflicted over the Christian suffering, but when he himself faces a fumier, he decides to do what saves his own flesh in the moment. Rodriguez accepted Christian faith as an individualistic and subjective kind of faith, rather than the universal kind of faith that is truly captivating. The makings and motivations of the idealist and the cynic are the same, but the end result is slightly different for each. As C.S. Lewis says, the idealist ends like a Greek comedy, one in which everything works out. It appeals to the universal pursuit of happiness that is futile for most. The audience enjoys the ending, knowing that they can never obtain it in real life. The cynic ends up like a Greek tragedy, one in which everything turns sour. Although this message is likewise sour and unsatisfactory, it is more than the idealist and the audience can empathize with. There may be some variation, but this is the end that the idealist and the cynic are both damned to. The secular hero fails to bring humanity closer to truth and purpose. The common hero is the next hero on the spectrum of common and redemptive grace. If the divisions of hero were put into terms of relationships, the common hero holds a relationship with others central to herself, a step beyond the secular hero's central relationship with herself. She is superior to the secular hero in her makings, motivation, and outcome because she engages in common grace. The three criteria for the portrayal of the hero is the existence of common grace, humble recognition of her position without it, and a response to it. The first distinguishing characteristic of the common hero from the secular hero is in the making of the character. The reason why common grace is necessary in the definition of a better hero is that humans are social beings. We were created in the image of God as naturally interactive beings. We die or go insane when we are isolated. Woman is created for man. A flock needs a leader. Bonding with others is the key to bettering ourselves. Someone who understands that is already more qualified to be a hero. Common grace is a testament to the truth, goodness, and beauty of God, whether implicitly or explicitly referred to in the film. Common grace also makes a superior hero because it is always a story of growth. Common grace allows a hero to progress from a position of real weakness to a resolution. And oddly enough, it begins with the hero acknowledging limitations and being vulnerable in order to let experience shape him. When other people become involved in his life, he starts to gain new and different perspectives on the world. Difficult, challenging, and big questions on life are raised and answered. By default, people challenge the hero to become a better person. A prominent example of this kind of making of a hero is in Wonder Woman. She leaves the comfort of her home in the Amazon island and heads straight into World War II to end the war by killing Ares, god of war. As the movie progresses, she moves out of an isolated island of women into the real world where men are. Even though she has grown up learning that men are impulsive warmongers, she sees Steve as an opportunity to help. She is able to build up a relationship of trust with him and relies on him not only to guide her physically through the ways of the land, but socially through the ways of man. Finally, the last display of common grace appears towards the end, when she sees that Steve is affected by the war, and she is conflicted whether or not to save man. But when she glances around her at the individual people she fought alongside with, and the ultimate sacrifice of Steve, she sees goodness and realizes that she too can make the right choice and defeat Ares. The motivation of the common hero, unlike the secular hero who wishes to glorify himself, is to glorify others. 
Usually there is some sense in which the other is incapable of saving himself, and the hero must be courageous, just, tempered, and prudent on their behalf. Wonder Woman says at one point, I will fight for those who cannot fight for themselves. Wonder Woman is motivated by her desire for mankind to be a people who will uphold justice and goodness like they once did. In her last fight with Ares, he says to her, they don't deserve your protection. To which she says, it's not about deserve. It's about what you believe, and I believe in love. The end result of the common hero, however, is that the hero earns the earthly joys, but loses the heavenly joys. Wonder Woman saves what she sees on Earth, the beautiful land, the laughter, and the lives of the people in it. However, in the end, Wonder Woman lacks the aspect of redemptive grace. Having been the god killer since birth, her power is derived from herself and not a holy other. Once again, the hero is her own savior. She has killed Ares, but by the end of the movie, she recognizes that she has done little to remedy man's state of nature, and still worse is yet to come. Redemptive hero is the highest hero on the spectrum of common and redemptive grace. This hero integrates both common and redemptive hero in his journey, both common and redemptive grace in his journey. He is dependent on the grace of God or holy other alone for strength and redemption from his sin. As example of the redemptive grace working to change the hero is Eustace from Voyage of the Dawn Treader from C.S. Lewis' Narnia series. In the film adaptation, siblings Lucy and Edmund Pevensey return to Narnia with their cousin Eustace, where they meet with their friend the prince for a trip across the sea aboard the royal ship the Dawn Treader. Eustace is the unlikely choice for the hero. His full name being Eustace, Eustace Clarence Scrub, he lacks social graces and enjoys treating his cousins as he would treat any of the arthropods in his considerable and repulsive collection. In one scene, he discovers an ancient rock defoul filled with treasure. But because the treasure is cursed, his own greed turns him into a dragon. He finally realizes his own fallenness and its repulsive nature and eventually uses his new form to fight the serpent attacking the ship. When he is wounded, Azen appears and roars, burning the dragon skin off of Eustace and returning him to his normal self. It is when Eustace is humbled and broken in both body and spirit, kneeling before his king, that Azen heals Eustace. He does not do this quietly, but with a roar, almost rebuking the skin off of Eustace, knowing that the true, the true redemption was not from the dragon curse, but from his own sin. The motivation of this hero is thus a transition from glorifying himself to glorifying Aslan, who is known by another name in his own world. The end result is that the redemptive hero receives both earthly joys and heavenly joys with more significance. Though the children must return to their own world, which festers in sin, and though the battle is unfinished, much like how it was in Wonder Woman, they carry with them the eternal hope of knowing what is on the other side, Eustace especially because Asim promises that he will return one day. To the joy that he experiences goes beyond restoration to his normal state. He experiences a greater glory than he had started his journey with. In the end, he discovers and delivers truth and freedom. Some would disagree with my analysis on heroes and in films. They would say that the redemptive grace and hero are abundant among Christian films. They would cite the examples of many recent Christian movies, such as the God's Not Dead series. While this Christian film contains aspects of redemption, the hero does not receive common or redemptive grace. In God's Not Dead 1, college student Josh Wheaton wins in a long debate with his atheist professor about God's existence. Absent of finitude or fallenness, he appears as a righteous martyr who is persecuted for his faith. While the movie does a good job of portraying the challenges of having Christian faith, Josh is in effect as a hero who brings the audience closer to God. Others might object, saying that not all heroes in Hollywood need to be redemptive heroes, that secular and common heroes have their respective roles. Yet my calling for re developing redemptive heroes is not a call to exclude or ignore the good insights we can gain from other heroes, 
but to include and expand the horizon to show those insights in the larger scale of God's redemption. For example, the Bible is full of violence and darkness, but they make sense only in the light of redemptive history. So we are in need of more redemptive heroes in Hollywood. And while Silence, Moana, and Wonder Woman have been critically acclaimed movies in and of themselves, their heroes are the products of mankind's desire and reflection upon themselves. Heroes formed according to our own standards of heroism. Often the heroes we create in the likeness of ourselves cannot carry us to deeper truth and meaning. However, when we create heroes that reflect the redemptive grace of God, these heroes help us to understand the deeper truth and meaning of life. C.S. Lewis himself was saved by one of these hero stories. One night in 1930, he was strolling the gardens in Magdalen College in Oxford University with his friend J.R.R. Tol Tolkien. Having just come out of World War I, Tolkien was describing the horrors of war to Lewis stressing their urgent need of a hope beyond this world. In ancient mythologies, gods sacrificed themselves to save people. Tolkien suggested that perhaps such different mythologies stem from a real event in history, that there stood a real hero behind the mythical ones. That night, Lewis accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. As this example illustrates, we are in need of more redemptive heroes in stories and in films because they can serve to stir up our imaginations for the one true hero, Jesus Christ, who meets us in our daily death and lifts us up to new hope, strength, and life.